Stand together, Exodus chapter 2. We are preaching through the life of Moses today. <clears throat> Could I get one of them Wilson boys to get a board up here for me real quick? I, just want, I think it would be helpful to me this morning. Exodus chapter 2, and let's begin reading at verse number 11. Everybody there say amen. amen. It came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out of the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together, and he said unto him that did the wrong, Why smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince or judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killedest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, <clears throat> Surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to, to the water of their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when he came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that ye are so, uh, come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us, and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, Where is he? Why is it that ye have left the man? Call him, that he may eat bread. I'd like you to go to the book of Acts chapter 7. We're going to read a few passages of Scripture there, and then go finally, and you'll keep your Bibles open or to, to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, Acts chapter 7, we'll start reading at verse number 22. Uh, here, Stephen is preaching... Uh, to the council, and he is given a history of Israel, and he comes now in the history of the Old Testament of Israel to the life of Moses. Verse 20 says, In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And when he, I'll let you keep that in mind there. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart. Now, I want you to underline that in your Bible. It came into his heart. You know, there's some things that need to come into your heart about serving the Lord. To visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him. Now, this is the New Testament account of what you just read in Exodus 2. And avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. Verse 25, for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, your brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who may be a ruler and judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? And then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons." And it continues on. Go to the book of Hebrews now, chapter 11, which is the great summary and doctrinal summary of Moses' life and, of course, of many of the lives of people in the Old Testament. This is a great chapter of faith in the Bible. And it's in verse 23. When you begin reading, we're going to read through verse 25 this morning, but you begin reading about the life of Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. Because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, now here's the verse, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. I'll read part of verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Father, help us preach today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to say before I start preaching today, again, thank you for being here. But uh, if you're here today and you're not saved, you've never been born again of the Spirit of God, we want to encourage you to be saved. In fact, we want to warn you, you better get saved. You're going to bust hell wide open. And we're not here, we're not here to play games with your soul. We're not here to play church. Uh, we're here to worship the Lord, to fellowship, and to preach the Word of God. And in the preaching of the Word of God, one of the things that Jesus says, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and preach that men should repent and believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have either been born again or you've not. You're either saved or you're not. And if you're not saved, we want to encourage you today with all of our heart 
Uh, you can get saved sitting right there in your seat. If those guys can get saved at the jailhouse, you can get saved at the church house. And you can get saved and what will have to happen is in your heart. And I'd encourage you while I'm preaching this morning that you'd just bow your soul before the Lord and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ that He suffered and died for you on the cross and that He rose from the dead, that He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And I'm telling you, just trust Him as you say, call on Him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I say that today in just in case I don't want you to leave this church house and say, they never told me how to be saved. I just told you how to be saved. And I also want to encourage you to take care of it. Now, we've been looking at this thing of Moses today in the life of Moses. And the first thing we looked at was Moses was a slave in Egypt. And that's a picture of us. You and I in the world, Egypt is a picture of the world. And you and I in sin are slaves to sin and slaves to the devil. But the second thing that the Bible, that we preached on, not just about him being born as a slave, you were born in trespassing and sin. In, mother, in sin did your mother conceive you? You're born in sin. He was born in sin. But the second thing in the life of Moses was, was he became a son. And we talked about he was a son. And we talked about the, what the greatest uh, uh, principle of parenting is this thing of faith. And so it talks about that. And he was adopted as Pharaoh's daughter and so forth. But this morning I want to preach on the subject today of, here's what, let me give you a, a deal that happens with God, how God's going to work in your life. God will save you out of the slavery of sin. God will make you a son. Then God's going to do something in your life. Now listen to me, so I'm preaching the Bible. God is going to separate you from this world. God is going to separate you from Egypt. And God in our text today is showing how that He separated Moses from Egypt and from Pharaoh. God wants you separated from the world, and He wants you separated from the devil. Then there's something that's going to happen to Moses later on, and we'll preach on this. Then God will make him and use him as a servant. This is the way God's going to work in your life. He'll take you out of the slavery of sin, make you His son, then He'll separate you, and then He'll make you a servant. But let me say something to you. You'll never be a servant of God as God would have you to be, until you get the doctrine of separation down. Now, preaching on the life of Moses today, let me just say this. You go 12 years of school in America, public school. I'd say that you can go to 8 or 10 years of college. You can get all kinds of degrees and never know about or learn about a man by the name of Moses in the educational system of this country. Moses is one of the greatest men that ever lived on the face of this earth. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Moses is a foreshadow of our Lord Jesus Christ. Moses was used to write the first five books of the Bible. And it just appalls me and amazes me, the ignorance that's in this country. Well, we don't even want to know about a man who affected everybody's life in this country and every country in the world by the name of Moses. And yet you can't even learn about him in the educational systems of America. Now, those who follow God in biblical separation. Now, if you want to write some thoughts down, here's the number one thought. This is the main thought I want to get across to you. Those who are saved, those who are sons of God, that are separated, are the people that God will use to impact the world around them. Now, let me say, your world may be just there at your kitchen. It may be there at your house. It may be over at your job. It may be at the feed store. I don't know where your world is. I don't know how large your world is. But I will tell you this, that the doctrine of separation is the doctrine that's going to impact even your children. Your children will either be impacted for God or against God by the doctrine, by your adherence to or rejection of the doctrine of separation in Scripture. God will use those who are separated unto Him for His glory and for mankind's good. You want to impact your world, God will do it through separation, biblical separation unto Him. As we look at the life of Moses, we're looking at one of the most clear, critical, uh, essential, absolute doctrines of the Christian faith. Do you know why America is in the mess it's in today? It's because churches and Christians have ceased to believe and practice in the doctrine of biblical separation. 
It's just what Donnie mentioned in Sunday school class about the ecumenical movement. It is just to bring everybody together, and everybody's fine. Doesn't matter what you believe. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter what you practice. We're all just going to get together under some little banner of religion, and everybody's going to sing Kumbaya, and we're all going to sway back and forth and be happy together. But God does not do that. Now, we'll bring out some things here pretty soon. The doctrine of biblical separation is throughout the Scripture. The Bible says that we're to come without the camp unto Jesus Christ. Jesus was taken outside the camp. He was outside the gate, Hebrew says. And He was crucified on the cross of Calvary. The the very basis of your salvation at the cross of Calvary is based upon the fact that a Savior separated Himself from the world, came outside the religious camp, came outside the religious gate, and was crucified and died on the cross for your sins and my sins. And He did that on the basis of separation. The Bible said, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by, by the renewing of your mind. The Bible tells us by that passage of Scripture, that that be not conformed to this world is you don't try to be like them. You don't imitate them. You don't want what they do. You don't look like they look. You don't dress like they dress. You don't talk like they talk. You don't think like they think. You come out from among them and you don't let them conform you to them. You conform to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a doctrine of separation. The Bible says friendship with this world is enmity with God. That implies separation. The Bible said love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. That implies separation. The Bible said have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That implies separation. Even Israel, when God brought them out of the land of Egypt, when God saved Israel to Passover and the blood was sprinkled, God said, get out of there. God wants you to get it when you get saved. God wants you to get away from the world, lest you be poisoned and ruined by the world. He took them out of Egypt. He didn't save them and leave them in Egypt. He took them out of Egypt. And then when he got through 40 years of wandering, he said, I don't want you to let your sons marry the heathen. I don't want your daughters marrying the heathen. I don't want you mingling with the heathen. I don't want you mixing with the heathen. He said, I want you to be separate from this world. Because he said, if you do, he said, it'll destroy you. God knows it will destroy you if you do not have to practice separation. How many understand separation in marriage? How many believe your wife ought to be separate from other men unto you? How many of you believe your husband ought to be separated unto you from other women? Yeah, you believe that. You understand that clearly. That's exactly what separation is all about. It does not mean separating from... You can be a monk and live down here in the monastery on Bryant Creek and die and go to hell. You can go out here and live in a tree like a tree hugger and die and go to hell. You can get away from everybody and buy you a a hole back in the holler and put up a fence and buy 15 dogs and put up no trespassing signs and die and go to hell. That is not biblical separation. Neither is biblical separation Phariseeism where you walk around bragging about how you dress right and spit white and do all that kind. You don't chew and you don't do this, you don't do that. That's not biblical separation. But what we're talking about is the biblical doctrine of separation, not just from the world, but unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the question. How will biblical separation affect you and yours? How will it practically affect your life? Well, there's some things that won't be in your home. There's some places you'll be, and there's some places you won't be. There's some things you'll do, and there's some things you won't do. And biblical separation just means that you want to do that which is pleasing unto the Lord, and you don't want to uh, displease Him. The world wants a faith that does not require you to separate. That's why we have all these contemporary worship services in America. They'll flat out tell you now. They're not even ashamed of it anymore. We want want the world to feel comfortable in our services. I want just the opposite. I do not want a lost man to feel comfortable in this church. I want him to feel loved. I want him to know that he's loved, unconditionally loved. But I do not want him to feel at ease in his sin. I do not want him to feel comfortable dying and going to hell. I want him trembling. I want him worried. I want him concerned that he could die and go to hell and bust hell open and be there forever if he's not saved. We're not trying to conform to them. We're, We're trying to separate now. The natural fleshly lust, and yes, even saved people that are carnal-minded, do not understand, nor do they appreciate, nor practice separation. Many despise and hate the doctrine of separation because it convicts them of their love for the world. And those who practice separation, God uses to bring, expose and bring conviction to them. Natural man would have reason to bet Moses. Now, I want you to go back to Egypt with me for just a little bit today. Now, I want you to think about where Moses really was. 
Moses, the Bible said, was raised in the house of Pharaoh's daughter. Josephus says, this is not in your Bible, and I don't know whether Josephus knows what he's talking about or not. He may be lying out of his teeth and made it up. I don't know. But he's a great, quote, historian. He did write a lot of things that have been found out to be true that they do not know about in secular history. But this is what Josephus said about Moses' adopted mother. She was Pharaoh's daughter, and she was incapable of bearing children herself. And Josephus says she had no children, and Moses was the adopted child. That means he was the grandchild adopted of Pharaoh, and that he was in line for the throne to become Pharaoh of Egypt. Now, that's no small thing. Now, the Bible says, teaches us about what happened with Moses and his father and his mother. Then he's taken Pharaoh's daughter, and the Bible says when he has come to years, there come a time in Moses' life when he chose... Between the faith of the Hebrew people and the life and philosophy of the Egyptian world. And the Bible says that Moses chose the people of God. The Bible said Moses chose the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses knew about Jesus Christ. Now the natural man would have said this. Now I want you to watch this carefully because this is where the rubber is going to hit the road with you in your daily life. If you had been a friend of Moses, let's say that you had been an uncle of Moses's. And Moses, every once in a while, comes down to the slave area to see his family. Hi, Mom. Mother's Day. I came down to see you. He's all got the entourage. He's all dressed up. He's in the chariots and the horses. You've all seen uh, Charlton Heston, haven't you? Okay. But he comes down there in that great entourage. And he steps out of his chariot. And he gives his mama a hug and maybe a dozen roses. And maybe brings her a gift from the palace. He says, Mom and Dad, I don't want to talk to you. He takes him in the living room, sits down, and says, I want to tell you something. I made a decision. I'm leaving Egypt. I'm leaving that paganism. And I want you to know that I'm embracing the God of Israel. Mom and Dad, do you understand what this is going to mean? He got an uncle sitting over and says, Wait a minute now, Moses. Wait a minute. I, I know you mean well, Moses, but you're getting carried away with this religious thing. You telling us that you're fixing to leave the palace and give up being a king and give up being a pharaoh, giving up being the ruler of the known world. Do you, have you really thought this through, Moses? Moses said, I've thought it through good. God has put it into my heart to deliver our people from this bondage and slavery. I'm a Hebrew. I'm of the people of God, and I serve the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. And I have placed my faith and trust in Him. And that's paganism. They're all dying and going to hell. They hate us. They hate the shepherds of God. They've made slaves out of God's people. And I'm leaving it. And I see maybe an uncle or maybe an aunt or maybe a cousin comes over to Moses and say, Moses, I want to give you a thought here. Now, Moses, you're inside. You're on the inside track. Moses, you can do your... Watch this. You can do your people a lot more good where you're at. Now, right here is where the devil's going to get you. I was sitting over in the school bus barn talking to the Norwood High School superintendent about he wanted to talk to me before we started this Christian school. You know what he told me? He said, you, he said that very thing. He said, you could do a lot more good over here at this school. We'll just set up so you can have some Bible classes over here. And I remember Brother Stamper, God clearly, clearly, the Holy Ghost of God shooting up a flare of warning and said, don't you buy that. You come out and you be separate. You separate yourself from this world. Let me tell you something. I believe with all my heart, soul, and mind, spirit. I wouldn't even be in this pulpit and this church wouldn't be here today if I'd made that decision to do that. I don't even believe this place would be here. Let me tell you something. God, the just, shall live by faith. God says, separate. The world says, infiltrate. Are you listening to me? Moses might have had some relatives. and Now, wait a minute, Moses. Man, you're inside the palace. You can get us all jobs. You can get us all positions. You can do all kinds of things. And Moses, you've got influence. And hey, Moses, don't do that. You're going to put, you're going to make Pharaoh mad at all of us. And we've got it bad enough as it is. And Moses, you're on the inside track, man. You can do more good inside than you could outside. You ever heard people say, well, we need to stay in the public schools so we can influence. Well, I got news for you. You ain't done a very good job influencing. 
is continuously going to hell in a handbasket. Oh, I got news for you. They won't even let you pray. We say, well, I pray some. Well, yeah, well, I tell you what, why don't you just try it Monday morning and get up here and say, hey, kids, stand up. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer today. And by the way, get your King James Bibles out. We're going to read Psalms 23 together. Well, that didn't have the Mountain Grove police down there after you. I would have said Norwood, but I don't know if Norwood's got any police or not. But anyway, Moses understood that God requires separation. And by the way, you can take this thing and run it to every realm of your life, not infiltration. Let me give you an example. John R. Rice, who many of you know, I mean, you may like him, not like him. I, I don't agree with everything John R. Rice believed, but I'll tell you where he was right at. John R. Rice was in the Southern Baptist Convention, and the Southern Baptist Convention began to put instructors and philosophers and professors full in their colleges that did not believe the Bible, and those were going out into the pulpits of the church, and it was infiltrating the movement. He, did, he, he tried a little bit to say, hey, stop it. We've got to stop this. We're being ruined. It's going to ruin our, it's going to ruin our movement. They wouldn't do it. You know what John R. Rice did? He said the Bible says, Come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. Have no fellowship with the unfruit works of darkness. He said, I have no choice but to leave the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm telling you this morning that constantly in the history of the church, God has required people to come out and be separate from that which will destroy the church. It's like believing you can do more good staying in some system where that's ungodless than you believe you can be out separate. Let me tell you something. It makes a bigger statement when you step out and say, I'm not going to be part of that, than it does you sitting in there and say, well, now, boys, I'm going to have to sit here. Say, I don't agree with that quiet. I don't agree with that quiet. But you stay, in the, you stay in the system. I'm telling you something. When you step out, it says, boy, that must be serious. In your family situations, when you take a stand for separations, it'll do more than all the compromising you'll ever do. You need to learn the, the doctrine of separation. Biblical faith says come out from among them and be a separate. Now, again, it's not Phariseeism. But can I say something to you young people? I'm talking to you young people here this morning, as well as mothers and fathers and everybody. But you young people are going to have to learn the doctrine of separation right now when you're 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, 13, 15, 17 years old. You need to learn the doctrine of separation right inside this church. Can I tell you, not every young person that attends this church is doing right, going to do right, wants to do right. Some of you kids want to live for God. You're going to have to make up your mind. You're not running around with them. You're not hanging around with them. You're not partying with them. You're not going here with them. And you're not going there. You're not even going to spend the night with them. Because of what you're going to get exposed to. You're going to have to stay away from the wrong people. You're going to have to stay away from the wrong influences, the wrong places. And you're going to finally have to say someday, I'm a Christian and I just can't do that. I can't go along with it and I ain't. You say, where did he get that? Where did Moses get it? I believe he heard about Joseph telling Pharaoh's, Potiphar's wife that he couldn't do this evil. You can imagine Moses being down. And I, hey, if this was nowadays, did you know, can you imagine anybody that's so stupid to give up a throne for a God you can't see? This man went from a throne. This man went from everything the world had to offer to a wandering shepherd out in the middle of the desert for 40 years. What motivates a man to do that? I'm telling you, the ways of God are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. What I'm looking for in this message today is for God to so implant this little seed of truth in the mind of some young man in this church, maybe three or four young men. Because I want to tell you something. Moses impacted this world unlike any man except Jesus Christ. And if we're going to have young men that impact this world for Christ... We're going to need young men who understand the doctrine of separation. And Moses, because he understood the doctrine of separation, he impacted the world. If the world was said, Moses, you can impact the world in the position you're in. Moses said, no, I don't understand it. But God said, get out. And I'm getting out. What would have CNN said? What would have Sean Hannity tried to get on his his broadcast and told somebody, hey, he would have tried to interview Moses. What are you doing this for? What, what's going on? I mean, you're going to put this country in, in a political upheaval. You're walking away from everything anybody in the world would want. What would have been the news story? I'm telling you something, it would have been a big news story if they'd have got a hold of it. I guarantee it went through Egypt like a fire. Moses is leaving the throne. He's giving up the throne. He's not going to take the position he could have had. I'm going to give you this. We're out of here this morning very quickly. I'm going to give you a few things that require, is involved in separation. And get it and write it in your soul. Number one, it involves the principle of refusal. The principle of refusal. We'll get to the different deal tonight on this, but I want to give you five things right here. Number one, he refused position. In Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible said in verse number 24, By faith Moses, when he was called to come to years, did something. Circle it in your Bible. What does it say? He refused. 
I'm going to give you five things that Moses refused that will make you a great man for God. Listen to me. Number one, he refused worldly position. Worldly position. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused to be king of a pagan world. And can I tell you, if you're going to be in fact your world for God, by the way, is that new baby here this morning? i got to unhook my train. Is that new baby here? I didn't even have you stand and show that. I'm telling you something, folks, we had a miracle happen. He had three boys, now they've got a girl. Would you show us that girl? <clears throat> I mean, she's got the prettiest head of hair. Karen said you put your hand on that hair, it feels like a downy pillow. Look at there. Now, ain't that a pretty girl? Amen. I mean, I, boy, I meant to do that. And we got another baby coming. I, it ain't here this morning. We got another one. But I'm proud of you guys. Amen. Amen. I'm glad you had that girl. Boy, I'll tell you what. You, she needs, them boys need somebody to line them out. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, here's the thing. He refused position. What did you refuse in the way of position? He would have been king. He would have someday been Pharaoh. That's a pretty big position. Now, let's just take it down a notch or two. But let me tell you what makes me sick in the United States. Listen, I realize we've probably got the best system of government if we've lived under it, lived by it. That's probably humanly possible until the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. But you know what makes me sick about our country is the political system. How you can buy offices these days. I'm telling you something right now. We've gotten so deteriorated, Abraham Lincoln wouldn't have had a shot at the presidency. I'm sick and tired of going to political meetings and watching everybody there jockey for position. That's why I don't go to them anymore. I am sick to death of this jockeying for position. I am sick to death. I'm going to tell you what jockeying for position is. When you give money, it will tell you something. We're buying our, our, we got the best politicians money can buy in America now. And by the way, all this, I'll tell you something. I, you know what? I believe they ought to have to run without any money. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, don't, can't even accept anything. My dad is sitting there in the back seat tonight, today, and daddy, you correct me if I'm wrong. But I believe you ran for office from about, what, 1940 what? 1948 to about 1974. 20 years as Douglas County Assessor and 14 years as State Representative. Did some of the banks not try to send you money when you were State Representative and you sent it back to them? Do you know why my dad sent the money back to them? He said when it comes time to vote for a bank bill and I'm not for it, they'll use the money they gave as pressure to tell me I own you. You vote how I say to And let me tell you something, too. We get enough horse in us to say, I'll tell you something, my God's bigger than your purse. We got a president that's owned by the sodomites in this country. Lock, stock, and barrel. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you boys and you girls something. Quit jockeying for position. Quit jockeying for position in your family. Quit jockeying for position in the church. Quit jockeying for position at work. Let God put you where He wants you, when He wants you, how He wants you. Quit jockeying for position. Quit buying your favor. Quit trying to buy your position with people. Makes me sick to my stomach. I honor my father for rejecting their money. Let me tell you something. That's what Moses had to refuse was position. Let me tell you what he did. Let me give you an illustration of this. Hillary got beat out by Obama. But she immediately wanted to line herself up for 2016. Do you know how, you know what he paid her with to, to get her lined up in the, in the general election? Secretary of State job. John Kerry was one of his biggest supporters in the Senate. One of the earliest biggest supporters. You know what he paid John Kerry with? When Hillier, when, when the Secretary of State's job wasn't doing her any good, it was starting to muddy the waters up for a presidential run, John Kerry then was paid off with Secretary of State job. I would tell you something, we've got a political system in this country that people line up to the trial. You know what Abraham Lincoln said one time? Oh, old boy walked in, Abraham Lincoln was all down and out. He says, uh, President, what's wrong? He said, too many pigs for the tits. Everybody in this country gives anything they want somebody to 
That's a cash dividend I've got. When I want paid, you better be ready to pay me back with it, bud. Remember what I did for you? Jockeying for position. You, if you're going to impact your world for position, the world's, I'm telling you, God is going to have to see a heart that refuses the desire to have worldly position. A lot of the time we're saying we want position for God's glory. The truth about it is down underneath that layer of crud is selfish desire to be somebody in spite of everything. Number two, he refused temporal power. I'll tell you something, Pharaoh had power. He could just order you death. Pharaoh's, by the way, on this thing of position, Moses traded position in Egypt for position in Christ. Oh, Moses saw past this thing. That's why the Bible said, by faith. Moses said, I'd rather have position with Christ than have position with Pharaoh, than position in this world. He did the same thing with this temporal power. He was Pharaoh's grandson. He could have been a world ruler. Let me tell you about power. This country's sick with it. It's all a big fight about power. 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 What power? I'm telling you, listen, power to order people around. Power to tell people off. Power to cuss people out. Getting quiet in here. I'm telling you what, we ain't nothing but a bunch of little toad frogs blowed up with their own hot air sitting on a cow pile. Belching out stinking air. Trying to be somebody we're not. Going to tell somebody off. Going to give them a piece of my mind. And then crawl back up and put your little religious regard on and act like everything's fine between you and God. Who are you kidding? You know what's wrong with churches? You know why that, eight, you know why that boy over in jail said he's eight years old? That there was... Uh, that, there, that, that his family quit church and moved out. You know what it was all about? Power struggle. Power struggle. You know, you know what's wrong with the churches? It's power struggles. That's exactly right. Say, listen, I'm talking about, listen, to give someone a little authority in this country. I mean, why is Barney Fife the most well-known person in America? Give him a little authority. I'll tell you something, there's nothing I respect any more than a law officer who, who has grace, who has wisdom, who has courage, who cares about his community, and is serving his community in righteousness. But there's nothing I despise any worse than a law officer who, because they put a badge on him, thinks he can run everybody down and arrest everybody and talk to everybody like a dog. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Put a little authority on people and it just goes to their head. Moses wanted power. There's nothing wrong with you wanting power. But he wanted power with God. He didn't want this simple little power of mankind. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. He said, lo, I'm with you always. You know what you need to believe? The day you start believing, the day you trade off worldly power for God's power is going to be the sweetest day of your life outside getting saved. Because I'm going to tell you something. God's with you who can be against you. I'm telling you something. If God be for us, who can be against us? Let me tell you something. The Jew is God's chosen people. He has walked over the grave of every oppressor for 6,000 years. He's walked over the grave of every oppressor because of the power of God. All of Hitler's armies could not conquer the Jew. All of Hitler's gas chambers could not conquer the Jew. Let me tell you something. The church of Jesus Christ is going to go through right on the glory land, and you better be where the power is at. Let me tell you something. He is coming back in power and in glory. And I'm telling you something. He's going to kill and slay the sword of His Spirit. I'm telling you something. The blood's going to roll four feet deep in the valley of Jezreel. I'm talking about real power. I'm not talking about white power, black power, green power, other kind of power. I'm talking about God's power. And Moses understood something. Refused the power of the world. Somebody says, oh, I'll get you in position. You'll have power. Back off. Amen. I'm telling you, when God does it, it's right. Some people are control freaks. They want to control everybody they're around. Moses wanted power, and he traded the power of this world for the power of God. You know what? Let me tell you, let me, let me tell you where the real power is. The real power is power to make you quit cussing. The real power is the power to make you quit being proud. 
The real power is power to keep you from being angry. Do you know why the world doesn't see our God as powerful? Because they don't see enough power in us to kill a mosquito. They're still mad. They're still angry. They're still lusting. They're still, uh, they're still covetous. They're, they're still, I mean, they're just, they're, they're, there's no power to deliver. And let me tell you something. We need to quit wanting this power, this fleshly power. We want God's power. That's the goal we want. God wants us to have that power that He gives. The third thing Moses refused was not just position and power, but was popularity. Oh, my land. There are kids all over America killing themselves over this issue right here. Because they were rejected and not popular. Acts 7.22 says he was mighty in words and deeds. This is a big issue. Popularity. Who's that? Oh, you know, that's Moses. <laughs> Thirteen years later out there in the desert. Who's that? I don't know. Some old shepherd. It just seems like, and, and I'm, I'm so guilty here, especially I can remember my teen years, you know, you just want to be accepted by everybody, want to be liked by everybody. The vileness in our entertainment in America is all about being popular. Because they just keep moving to more stages of vileness and nastiness and filthiness in order to be seen and recognized and, quote, made popular with the world. I'm telling you something. Girls, boys, reject the world's popularity. Do not strive to be popular with your peers. You know what peer pressure really is? It's a popularity contest. It's about being accepted by those that you're around. And what the deal is, when the world says, if we accept you, you're going to have to give up some things. And God says, no, you separate from them. You don't want their popularity. Here's the deal. Trade off acceptance with the world for acceptance with Christ. We are accepted in the Beloved. I would rather have Jesus, the song says. He refused worldly popularity. I'm telling you something. Listen, this business about being accepted right here in this church, right here in this church. You know what? Some of you kids need to grow up and just say, you know what? I don't, it's not, it's not a big deal whether I'm accepted or not accepted by the other kids. I'm going to stay with Christ. I'm going to do right. I'm going to live right. I'm going to dress right. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do the right thing. And I don't care if everybody else likes it. And if the other kids in this church don't go along with me on it, that's too bad. I want to be accepted by God more than I want to be accepted by my buddies. All you boys, listen to me. Who do you want to be accepted by? You say, well, you know what? Down in your heart, I know you want your life to count. And I'm giving you the secret for making your life count today. Smile. Amen. You reject the world's position. You reject the world's power. You reject the world's popularity. And you take Christ and God will impact this world through your life automatically. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. He traded that popularity. Number four, he refused pleasures. Hmm. Hebrews 20, 11, 25 says, to, then to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, let me tell you what you're going to have to do if you want to be used of God. You're going to have to reject some pleasures. This world wants pleasure without responsibility. I'm going to say this flat out. It's true. All you, all you teenagers look at me right now. All you young people look at me right now. Sin has pleasure in it. And we'll let nobody tell you it doesn't. Sin has pleasure in it. You ain't stupid. You can see people having pleasure in sin. Right? But here's what Moses understood. That it was for a season. Don't last. I'm going to tell you all something. Now you listen to me. That boy that's out here whoring around. And he's got a baby out of wedlock. And he cocks around like he don't, don't bug him. You ain't seen him in, in private. You ain't seen him weep in his car. Let me tell you something. Right here in this town, in this town, I've known of young, young people who've ended all over that kind of stuff. And this world never tells you what the end result is. Let me tell you something. This pleasure crowd, I'm going to tell you, this, this running around and whoring around and all that kind of stuff, I'm going to tell you something. They don't show you behind the scenes. And they, don't, they can't show you what's going on in the mind and the heart, the torment and the fear and the guilt that's going on. They can't show it to you. But it's just for a season. And when it's over with, I'm telling you what, it's a crash and burn. 
But I want to give you a verse. It's six, Psalm 1611. It's my wife's favorite verse. I think at least one of her favorite verses. It says, in thy presence, I can't even quote it right now. But anyway, there are pleasures forevermore. Here's what Moses did. Moses traded temporary pleasures for eternal forever pleasures. All right? Now, I'm telling you this morning this. I'm going to, does anybody think Moses had opportunity for pleasures in the palace? Does anybody think there's some good-looking women hanging around? Think there's any parties to go to? I want to tell you something. It staggers my mind what that man refused when you really get to thinking about it. When you get to thinking about what he turned down for Christ. But you know what really staggers my mind? It's what Christ did with him because he turned it down. And that's what I'm after this morning. I ain't, I, I ain't mad at nobody. I love everybody. I'm happy. Hey, Caleb, I want to tell you something. You learn about Moses. You trade these things. God will use you. God will, but you've got to learn this doctrine. And I don't know where you're going to get it. If you don't get it in church, you don't get it. You can get out of the Bible. You don't get it nowhere. He refused pleasures. I could go on with this stuff, but you know, hey, by the way, you know something. I, I can really don't understand all this stinking same-sex marriage and all that junk. Have you ever seen them guys that this dying of AIDS? You ever seen them? Isn't that sick? I mean, you know, Brother Dean, I want to walk up to him and say, hey, listen, it's a lot of fun. When the first time you got, first time you got hooked up to that crowd, you thought you was having a big time. You thought you'd entered into Zenith world. You thought you was into death. And now you're dying! Going to hell! Is that a lot of fun now? I'm mean, telling you something. Listen, how sick the world can be. I'm telling you, but you know what? God has pleasures forevermore. You know what? I ain't never went out and cried in the woods over, over doing right. <laughs> I ain't never went out and mourned over standing up for us right and living right and living clean. I ain't never done that. But oh, mercy me, when I've seen my soul alive, you taught, brought, brought grief to my soul. Last thing, we're going to go home. He refused possessions. Mm-hmm. He refused possessions. You know who owned all the land? You know who owned everything? Pharaoh did. Oh, Pharaoh owned it all. Oh, Moses. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine trading off all the possessions of Egypt? You say, well, did he really have much? Hey, I've been over there at King Tut's little deal. Did you know what they buried little Tut in? Uh, yeah, half or three-quarter inch pure gold casket. I'm shaped in the form of his body, nose, and eyes. They buried him in it. What kind of money do you think he lived with if he died with that kind of money? Yeah. I'm telling you something. It is no little deal. When you read your Bible and it says Moses refused this stuff, the treasures in Egypt, it means something, buddy. And I'm going to tell you something. We need to learn how to refuse the treasures in Egypt. I thank God for trees and grass and water, and I thank God for birds and flowers and even groundhogs that run, and I even thank God for squirrels that don't know how to get out of the road once in a while. But I'm going to tell you something. Listen, I don't even want... I'm not interested in Manhattan Island. I'm not interested in a flat up on top for a million two. I'd rather live in a tent in the Ozarks. Amen. Amen. I'd rather worry about a copperhead calling in my tent than somebody getting in my house in St. Louis. I just said, but you know what? And that's just temporal. I'd, I'd rather have Jesus. I'm telling you something. All the money. If I die, I told Karen, I said, you'll either die broke or in debt. One or the other. Get ready for it, honey. Amen. <laughs> I get tickled. My daddy said one time he heard a man say this. He said, he said, you ain't got a very big wood pile. He said, I ain't cutting wood for my husband's next, my wife's next husband. <laughs> he said, that bothered me, her, her, him a burning my wood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen, you know something? Hey, you know who's rich in this world? As a, a husband and wife that loves each other getting along. Yeah, they're rich. All that husband and wife who go to bed at night and snuggle up to each other and tell each other they love each other and hug each other, you know, and talk about the kids and talk about how good God's... Been. That's rich people. Amen. Oh, you said they're living down there in the house that was built back in the 20s and the things are in up with t- and they got and they got this on the outside. Oh, they're living down there in a 60 by 12 trailer house. Oh, but they snuggled up to each other. And maybe that old boy in that big house in the brick that you wished you had, he and his wife might be fighting like cats and dogs. <laughs> well, I see ladies, they come to auctions and buy skillets all the time, and I know they can't use that many skillets. 
Amen. Let me tell you who's rich. Who's rich? Say, get up in the morning with a clear conscience. Go to bed and go. That's rich. Amen. Are you folks rich? I think you're rich. Don't you live off down here in Booger County? Whatever possessed you to move into Booger County? Did you hear any whippoorwills down there? Oh, good land living. The other morning I woke up standing in the bathroom. I said, I'm rich. Yes, Steve, and there's an old animal out there going, Woo, goo, goo. Karen says, what is that? I said, that's a morning dove. And then every once in a while, Oh, my land. And then that beats anything I've ever seen. Mr. and Mrs. Goose moved into our pond. <laughs> Went down there and had a, laid a whole bunch of eggs. And, lay, and all of a sudden, here's all these geese down there. And here goes, I don't know. I hope it's Daddy leading. <laughs> I don't know whether Daddy's in the back or the front. I, but in the, down in the middle is all these geeses. And what do you call them? Ganders or gooses or whatever you call them? Goslings, thank you. And and I'm watching them things, and boy, they'll, they're going through the water just all and put boil off of what the front one does, the back one does. It's expensive to watch them, Clayton. That's high class entertainment, amen. Oh, listen to me. Moses, trade it off. Oh, I said, dear Lord, why do I have to be out here listening to all this? Why couldn't I be in high rises listening to the horns and sirens? Listen to the folks fight across up, 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 up the next floor and down the hall. Oh, we're rich. And you've got a Bible you can read in the church to go to and you're rich. Amen. You're rich. I want to tell you something. The day I traded off this world for Jesus Christ, I got wealthy. Let's stand and go home. My, 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 my belly said church is over with. Paul said, I've counted it all but done that I may win Christ. Amen. Good to have you folks in the back, back there. Where are you all from? Huh? I thought you said Australia for a minute. <laughs> We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. We're glad everybody's here. And I want you to know, listen, the riches of Jesus Christ, the best thing you've ever had in your life. Amen. I'll tell you what they can. They, they, I, 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 oh, my. I, I want to preach, but God's saying get out of here. Let the mamas have some time with their families. Amen. Kenny, you're awful handy. Yes. There's a shower for who? The Bradshaw baby. Which one would that be?